Well, good morning, folks. This is going to be a fantastic interview with an old friend and superstar, Simon McGrath. Uh, Simon can tell you his story very shortly. We've known each other for a long time, and Simon did a fantastic interview with me last week on Fremantle Radio, which we'll, we'll talk about as well. But Simon, welcome aboard to this Leading Your Best Life podcast. Lee, thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here. Mate, what a week we had last week. Simon, uh, that Happy. interview, people have been giving us all sorts of great reviews on it, haven't they? Yes. Beautiful. We covered a lot of territory, everything from Paul Keating, the referendum, uh, Bendigo, Eagle Hawk, Chucky Major, Ginger Hayes, all about Lee's life. But today I want to delve down into the Simon McGrath journey and life and learnings and lessons uh, because leading your best life really is about people, particularly in people in business, but not necessarily always in business. How do we actually get the best out of ourselves? So, Simon, let's start with the Simon McGrath story. Where has Simon McGrath come from? The Simon McGrath evolutionary story. Go. Yeah. Okay. Um, my parents, I came from North Wales, emigrated to Australia when I was 10. Oh. My parents uh, have always been small business people, so that was part of our house. So the conversation was always around um you know, what was the next thing to do and, and the focus of small business. Um, my mother comes from a small Welsh village um, called Llanvartachen oh. in the Welsh North Wales. And my father uh, was uh, born in the Isle of Sheppey in the mouth of the Thames um, near, near Rochester in Kent. And um, he was a Batman in the army, uh, which means he looked after the colonel, the mm -hmm. commanding officer of the, the barracks. And um, I think that had an influence on his life and conversely had an influence on my life. Mm. My mother is um, almost like an empath. She's uh, She just kind of knows what's going on in all arenas, political, social, uh, relationship. Um, it very, um, it's almost, uh, silence not the word, but she's almost monk-like in terms of her, but she has a deep understanding of many, many things. And my father would be utterly lost without her. Wow. Um, the So we came to Australia in 1968. Um, I'm 64 years of age. Um, I went to Coonawarra Primary School. I remember my first day there as a uh, uh, little pommy immigrant and, uh, you know, I got beaten up by the kids. I think it was grade four four or five or something. So it was a pretty passive beating up, but it taught me, um, you know, it was, I don't have any regrets or resentments around, um, you know, the way I was treated as an immigrant kid. It just was. And you learnt, it taught your skills, how to settle in, uh, how to be politically uh, astute and read what was going on and basically get on and fabulous country to get on in. And then I went to Coma High School did okay. I got. But where's, uh, where was Coonawarra? I keep thinking that's in the Eastern States, but it's here somewhere, isn't it? Manning. Doesn't exist. Okay. The suburb is now called Karawarra. Uh -huh. And there was a primary school that was sort of surrounded by bush and, and pine plantation. It was a great place to grow up, a heap of fun. And um, it doesn't exist today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so what was the lessons? Give me one or two lessons you you got from that first beating up. Um. The importance of awareness, that was probably it, just to not look inwards but look outwards. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that I'd always be okay. That I, it would always work out every single time. I'd always Beautiful. be okay. It's a very um, powerful, empowering belief. It's always going to work out. It's a pretty powerful core belief yeah, yeah. to have, isn't it? I, I guess. And um, oh, I could jump way, way into the future now, but my I'd started some uh, businesses and my father uh, said to me, what if it doesn't work out? You know, like, what if? Mm. So, well, you know, I'll dust my knees off and go again. Mm. That was it. Mm. Mm. And that mm. kind of goes back to being a, a primary, at primary school, figuring out what it takes to get on. Wow. <laughs> Just like whatever it takes and not being sorry for yourself. Uh, well, so your education, where did you go? Primary school, secondary school? Did you go to college or uni or anything like that or? Entry into um, Curtin to do a thing called industrial art would have meant I'd been a manual arts teacher, uh, which mm -hmm. I I would have really enjoyed. And uh, you know, I love well that shirt. That shirt you're wearing makes you look like a manual arts teacher. So you haven't lost it, that's for sure. Yeah, thank you. And um, uh, but I chose not to go. I'd, I'd met a um, a character called Gary Thompson, 
-hmm. and he had a real estate firm and he sold businesses. And I was only 17. And I thought, that's it for me. I'm going to go off and sell businesses. And so I did at the age of, I think I was 17, 18, which is insane. Yes. Insane when I think about it now. But I did sell the Ashfield um, IGA, the supermarket in Ashfield, at the age of 18, which is, I just look at it now and I go, how the hell did that happen? Anyway, well, you I, obviously created trust in the buyer that an 18 year old could sell a supermarket. Yeah, well, he he did. Uh, yeah. But I soon realized that uh, it was. I was just way out of my depth. And then uh, he started a nightclub called Annabella's Nightclub in uh, on the Esplanade, where the where the bell tower and um, the, uh, the Carlton Hotel is these days. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was an old Chinese restaurant that he converted into a nightclub. Anyway, um, I was the doorman. I mean, like, I as an eighteen year old, I talk as an eighteen nineteen year old. Tough Simon McGrath, the doorman. I was like the love machine. I would just talk to you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and, talk you uh, into submission. I never got into any trouble. There was yeah. no fight. Yeah. There was um, sort of understandings and conversations, and uh, it was great fun, really great fun. Uh, it was back in the disco era. Uh, yeah, it was just a fantastic thing. And I was a barman there for a while and then um, kind of uh, realised that, you know, working until five in the morning is just uh, not a healthy existence and I need no. to do but I met all the nefarious characters of the underworld of Perth. We'd go to casinos in Northbridge after work. And, uh, yeah, it was like a very, very interesting time of my life. And I'm glad I did it. You saw the other side at that point. Uh, yeah. I'm not so sure it is the other side now. It is oh. it's a side. Uh, a side. Yeah, good thing. Yeah. We all have that in us, you mm -hmm. know, and light. Mm -hmm. And um, so then uh, I got a job then with uh, Ace Theatres as what they call a cadet manager. Yeah. So I was at the age of 20 or something and uh, was managing um, Cine Centre, um, Paris Cinema, the Capri Cinema, the Townhouse Cinema, and doing that sort of thing, which is um, kind of was a good grounding in, um, you know, I had to do the pays and, and schedule the advertising and uh, make sure the place was, you know, we had cleaners and lots of stuff and usherettes and all that sort of stuff. Great place for a young guy to be. And um, movies, you would have seen a lot of movies or you didn't get to see movies. We got to see everything. Yeah. And even the, because there was like it was an uh, exchange. If there was something on somewhere else, well, all the other managers would just let you in. You know, no, you never paid for a film. So yeah. I did that for quite a while. And then one day I was doing the pays and I, there was a guy that worked there and he was getting close to retirement. He'd been there all his life and his pay was the same as my pay. Mm -hmm. And I kind of go, mm, no, this is not a place for be hanging around. Yeah. But so, uh, essentially, um, I knew that my days there were numbered, had a great time. It's um it's it's a great place for a man to work because there's so many women. If that's oh, that's a good that's a very good reason to take a lower pay as there's a, <laughs> other benefits. So there were you know, like lots of fabulous usherettes, students, you know, uh, university students, girls, all around the same age as me. It was um, a terrific time. Mm. And um, so then my parents had started a business and it was it was going OK. But they came to me and they said, look, if you were to join us, we would give you a third share in any goodwill and collateral that you created from this point forward. Nice. So I, it was a terrific opportunity. I didn't realize what a wonderful opportunity it was at the time, but I was able to, I embraced it. And so that little business uh, became a business called WA Cactus Research. It was a wholesale cacti and succulent nursery. Wow. My parents did all the growing and I did all the selling. Yeah. Anyway, built that business up into a, a really a big, impressive uh, wholesale nursery. Um my father, you know, man of, I think he was finished his education at the age of 14 or 15 or something. And, um, you know, got thrown out of home, worked in a scrap iron yard, um, you know, tough times following uh, World War II. Mm. And my mother from a simple Welsh village, um, sheep farmer's daughter, uh, built a really successful, uh, highly profitable, well-managed small business, a nursery. We employed probably about eight people. 
um, sold to all the major supermarkets, exported into Japan and Singapore, uh, and ended up that um, my father, you know, this this man that left school at 14, ended up having two Rolls Royces at the same time. He had a Oh, thank you. He had a soft top uh, Corniche, which was, you know, gorgeous thing. Uh, and he had a, a silver shadow at the time that was the ex-Lord Mayor, who he used to work for. Anyway, yeah. so what I'm saying there is it worked out well. Mm. Anyway, um, my parents went away on holiday and we had been trying to sell the business by advertising it in places like um, South Africa and in Asia and that sort of thing in the newspapers, which wasn't working. And um, at the, that time, Waldex had floated their nursery, uh, which was a big business with mm. uh, renovation arm and uh, I think an electric electronics arm and various things. So they were on the second board, I think it was, of Perth Stock Market, and we're looking at acquisitions. I realized this. My father went away with my mother. They went to uh, on a holiday. They'd forbid me to talk to Waldex because they believed we would be replicated. We wouldn't be bought. We'd just get, you know, copied. Right. Anyway, I realized that the product we were selling, it, it, the barrier to entry was quite high because you, you can't grow these plants fast. They're not mm. like so I knew that they, they wouldn't, or I believed they wouldn't copy us, that they would actually uh, purchase. Anyway, they did. And this allowed my parents then to have a a, a very comfortable retirement at an early, quite an early age. Beautiful. Um, so the, uh, I'll tell you quickly about the negotiation. So uh, Wally Edwards, the ex-West Australian cricketer, mm -hmm. and Waldeck were the owners of um, Universal Waldeck. Yep. Um, they were... They looked at the business. They looked at our books. They'd had um, assessors come and value our business. And we were now in a boardroom, their boardroom, not ours, because we didn't have a boardroom. We yeah. had greenhouses, you know. Yeah. And um, they um, they said, well, we're interested. We'd like to buy you. What sort of money are you talking? And um, it was at this point that I learned the value of silence, so mm. not filling the space. Yes. Uh, we had uh, my parents had muted a, a price that um, they would have sold the business for, and Bordex knew this, but they wanted us to declare it. Yeah, uh, put out then, the number. Yeah, and then to, like a solid number. Yeah. Anyway, so um, I, at the time, added two hundred thousand dollars to that number. Beautiful. And this is going back uh, early eighties. Yeah. And okay, so here's the number. And, the, and I said the number. My father just looked at me and he went, have you gone mad? Like under his mm. breath. And mm. I keep under the table and I just shut up. Yeah. Say another word. Yeah. It was a sort of an uncomfortable, say, 15 seconds. Yeah. They looked at each other. And then I think Wally Edwards nodded his head. Barry Waldeck nodded his head. And they said, okay, we'll go ahead. We'll move, move ahead. Anyway, um, the... The you know it back in the eighties this business sold for uh, just like an absolute smidge under a million dollars. Stunning. That's a forty five years ago. That's a lot of money. Yes. So let's say it's probably you'd think eight to ten million these days or something to that effect. I don't know. Probably I haven't mm. done the but no. What it was, it was a very very satisfying moment. Yes. Taught me the the importance of uh, silence in negotiation. Oh, Not need. To fill that gap, mm, but so oh um, I walked outside, and my uh, my actually here's get this. I drove my uh, Maserati Ghibli that was owned by Brit Eklund's to the meeting, mm. and my father drove his his blue Silver Shadow Rolls Royce to the meeting. So it was mm. kind of, it was a celebration of um, of the a completion, and I, and I find this this is really an important part of business is getting to the end. Getting, getting, having the completion. Mm. So not having things go belly up mm. before, you know, the end, the light at the end of the tunnel. So mm. I was particularly proud because I delivered this, this resolution to my parents, which allowed them to retire. And then, uh, mm. so they haven't worked for, gosh, for, forever. And they've become um, pensioner share traders and they're bloody good at it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. 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 Mate, anyway. what a fantastic Piece of story. Yeah, you, you're going to continue because it sounds like you've got more to tell me. Rex for quite a few years as their marketing manager. Um, then... Um, was that part of the 
uh, uh, negotiation that you would continue to be hired or they wanted you to be hired? Wasn't I? W- I was taken out of the the cacti and succulent nursery, mm-hmm. and they moved their people in because they they already had uh, uh, an avenue to sell the product, so they didn't need me effectively. So then I went into uh, exporting wildflowers, and um, we basically would tour around Australia visiting wholesale nurseries um, and selling wildflowers. It was kind of kind of good, but I could read the writing was on the wall. That, that business was poorly managed. There was leakage everywhere. You um, say leakage, people stealing things, or what do you mean by leakage? Waste of money. Every waste of money. Yeah. Um, I could see things, and it's instinctive. It's like, like I say, when you grow up in a small business household, where from right from breakfast, lunch, dinner, you you sit down and you talk about what what's got to be done next, which actually brings me to another point in a minute about focus. Mm. And um, so, I could just see all over the place. It was top heavy in management um yeah it wasn't going to work anyway so i had um i decided i would i'd i'd met some people in the film industry and had some you know some good mates in advertising and i thought i would start a um video production brokerage Mm -hmm. and so left waldex and i did start a a video production brokerage working for two guys who made uh, corporate videos and i did their marketing and i would get a slice of um you know percentage I was, I'd have a, a little office and then next to the office was an editing room and a guy called Don Shepard who started Shepard Baker Studios in Perth, which used to do the majority of all the film uh, work. They did all the filming for Woodside and um, film, made a uh, documentary called Born in Fire, which is about the North Coast Shelf. Anyway, they, so these guys are very accomplished filmmakers mm. and would hear me on the phone day in, day out, just phoning corporations, um, doing the phone work. That mm. brings me to another point in a minute. We'll talk about the importance mm. of doing the work. Mm. Um, he, one day I was leaving late at night and a big black Mercedes Benz with darkened windows pulled up to, next to me as I was walking to my car and down this, this electric window went down. It was Don Shepard, who's mm-hmm. just, great guy anybody who knew don shepherd loved him he's ex-west australian uh, journalist and um he the window came down he goes g'day son i go g'day don what can i do for you he goes uh if you're free tomorrow come and see me tamac video corporation mm. and uh we want to talk to you mm. so basically he was um i was headhunted i was pitched from mm. All production house to go to the biggest production house in Perth, which was Tamac Video Corporation, which became um, well, it was actually built to become Channel Ten. It was yes. a uh, uh, Laurie Connell built it. Yes, he didn't get the license. Kerry Stokes got the license for Channel Ten. That's what, mm-hmm. but this was a huge studio. No, no, I used to do a lot of TV. We did the TV commercial with Graham Kennedy there. We did the Thomas Tyres commercial there. I did the Lotteries commercial there. So I know Tomac very well. I sat with my pants off all day with Graham Kennedy when we shot the uh, Datsun. Uh, N- N- Datsun is now dropping its name to Nissan. Uh, <laughs> so so all of that. So, mate, keep telling me because I'm getting little flashbacks as you're talking. So I was their marketing manager for quite oh, a like We probably crossed paths. Probably you know, because I was there many times uh, shooting things. Yeah. And uh, then this very interesting thing happened. There was a, a, a man arrived in Perth called Peter Llewellyn. Yes. He was a Cockney Englishman, tall, flashy dresser, a bit of a Donald hair, Donald Trump hairdo. Mm. Um, very interesting man. And nobody could figure out quite why. And he essentially took over the company and it's complete operation and i spent and i mean days in the boardroom listening to this man tell stories Mm. about how great he was you know he was a cockney trump you know and uh so he essentially took over the running of the business and the story was that he was going to buy it he bought it on a promissory note or some weird (laughs) a smoke screen a smoke screen, literally what it was. Anyway, yeah. so then he went on a campaign of buying all the modeling agencies in Perth to get all the models. The talent. Yeah. Hey, Mac. Shocking idea. Yeah. He, Other than he wanted to be surrounded by good looking girls. Pretty much. 
Mm. He wasn't thinking of us when no. he did. Anyway, so I got to go on junkets through Asia to um, Hong Kong, Singapore, um, selling film production work in Western Australia. And um, I'd landed some pretty good contracts. I'd landed a contract for the petrochemical plant. And then they didn't go ahead with the petrochemical plant. Oh, that petrochemical plant. The, that one. the $400 Which, million dollars that went into a pile of dirt down Quinanawa or somewhere. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And um, oh, and some, several advertising. We'd bring down uh, Asian high flyer people in advertising. They'd stay at the Burswood all weekend um, playing at the casino. And we'd they know more. Yeah. In their TV commercials. There you go. Yeah. Anyway, so but whose money was he spending, this Peter Llewellyn? Not his own, I imagine. No, Taymac Video Corporation was made up of one, and this is actually the the telling point, the Machiavellian nature. Um, it was made up of a group of farmers and doctors who uh, had owned shares in it, okay? Uh, now, they were um, unsecured creditors, I think. Perfect. Went, and Laurie Connell. Ah, Laurie Connell, yeah. Because I was going to say, who sold them in to that? So it was Laurie Connell and the team, yeah. The team. And it was essentially uh, Peter Llewellyn, and I only found this out years later, was sent in to drive it bankrupt. That was his job. You are kidding me. And, um, well, okay, so I do I know it's fact? No, but God, it certainly looked like it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that, that was certainly the, the direction of the line it was going oh. down or the debt was going oh. up, one of the two, yeah. It was a wild time, an absolutely wild time. Uh, great thing to experience. Um, anyway, the... Um, <laughs> All sorts of shenanigans were going on, and we had a uh, uh, outside broadcast generator that um, was so big it would like power a suburb. This yeah. generator, and there was a um, before everything was sort of auctioned off and cleaned up. This generator just disappeared. Went where else? Mm. Very valuable item, mm. and, I, and I was later told that where it went was you know the um one of the directors uh, sort of you know it was sort of whisked away before the uh the liquidators could even see it or got hold of it or whatever you know it's just like and I'm, my job was taking advertising agencies to lunch and i've took a fabulous whole bunch of friends today uh from the advertising industry from back in those days and um i you know i, I go out with these guys still quite a lot mm. all 20 30 years later and um, I, um, my job was taking them to lunch a lot. So I got interested in lunching. <laughs> anyway, so that got me on to, I, I realised that Tamac was about to implode and I got out of there and I took over a lease next to the street cafe in Northbridge, next between the, uh, European Foods and the street cafe. There was a little shop on the corner, which used to be a pizza oven uh, place called La Brace. And um, I turned that into Ted's Cafe and uh, operate owned and operated that for a couple of years. My first name's Edward. I oh, saw that, Edward. So that's right. That Ted comes from Edward, huh? Right. So, uh, and there I met even more characters and fabulous people in and around Perth. And um, so I ran that for two years. The first six months was horrendous. I was tearing up money and feeding into this business. And then one day... I opened up the TV Week magazine, you know, the insert that goes into yes. the West. In the middle, yeah, the TV pages, yes. He bought the West to get the TV yes. guide. And the inside cover was a really coveted place. Yes, it was. All I remember we'd all go, that would be the first thing you'd go to in That's that right. paper was the inside cover of that uh, cut TV magazine. At the time, uh, Twin Peaks, the um, HBO. TV. yes had just been launched and it was like everyone was talking about Twin Peaks it was the first thing of its type and we so we had a um a Laura Palmer salad on the menu mm -hmm. and the only, only reason was it was it came in its own body bag that's the only reason we called it the Laura Palmer oh salad oh my god salads in the morning tie them up and then we'd serve them in a, in their bag onto the table and you'd cut open the bag and you'd dress it yourself. Okay. And that was why we called it the Laura Palmer salad. Yeah, yeah. This thing went bang on the inside cover of the TV mag for the, for the West. 
and it, it occupied well, two thirds of the page. And it's a terrific article about, you know, Tihi, you know, these people have got, you know, tongue well and truly planted in their cheek, et cetera, blah, 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 Laura Palmer salad, body bag. And then that was it. So the next day, I had a queue from my front door down to the Aberdeen hotels. Right. And we did, um, we seated, I think we had 140 people in the, in the restaurant the cafe. And like, we just turned those seats over, like no one's business. And then from that moment onwards, it just exploded. And it was a fantastic business after that. So that's the power of me of media and the power of, uh, you know, marketing. Um, yeah. You know, it was great fun. But these things are uh, transient. I realized that that wouldn't be a great business for, well, probably longer than I would predict. But, you know, it everything has its life and I was keen to move on. So I sold that um, to a guy that came out of Rothwell's bank and he ran it. Um, a part of the deal was that I, I got a year's free dinners. So I could go back and just have dinner it was great because i all my friends were there you know my staff yeah, yeah. so i uh, went back one sunday rainy sunday afternoon and he had um 6ky on the radio and i realized that the heart had gone it was dead and um because i would like we'd rule the, the sound system with an iron fist and like each night we'd like friday night would be 50 60 70s pop and rock and roll and the place would just absolutely pump and people loved it and then sunday we did cool jazz all afternoon wow monday was uh sort of like slightly laid back sort of uh enyo and spiritual you know stuff we had each day of the week had to have its own vibe nice. uh, the advertising awards school used to meet there um yeah, it was, it was kind of like a really good business, but I knew, well, it was a good business. It made it great money. It was a groovy money. place. You, you groovy consciously place. created a groovy place. I did. Which he wasn't in, he did not understand or was not in tune with. He did. A banker thinking about creating a groovy place. Hmm. That would be a problem or could hmm. be a problem. And he also spread himself a bit thin. He got another shop in a shopping center, um, but it, it hmm. wasn't heart driven. It needed to be heart driven, that type heart of thing. Heart driven. I like that. Yes. Um, he he went bankrupt. He went bust. And it wow. has vacant, that site, probably one of the best cafe sites in Perth for nigh on 25, 30 years. Literally. Oh, my goodness. Big cafe. They closed up years ago. And it, I think it's going to get bulldozed shortly. The um, original owners of the real estate did come back to me and say, would you, um, you know, would you consider going back in? And nothing would tempt me. No. Um, they, um, you know, it's like old business, old fashioned business and a slightly uh, mafioso. Um, they, I had to money changed hands in order for me to exchange the lease. So I'd sold my business, oh. but I needed to um, transfer the lease across to the new owner. And unless I greased some palms, there was wow. no. Wow. Wow. So how did you get into real estate from there, from Ted's cafe to real estate? Well, uh, there's a few other steps, but essentially I lost all my money. I'd burnt, I'd burnt, this is back uh, 80s. I started real estate in August 19, oh, wow. I thought it was 98. Yeah, mm -hmm. August 1998, I started real estate. Mm -hmm. And um, what had happened, I'd opened three cafes up in shopping centres. There was a retail um, building boom. All the uh, superannuation funds were flushed with money from the mm. superannuation guarantee levy. They owned the shopping centres. The shopping, they this is, you know, they knew that they had to spend this huge amount of money, which was flowing into superannuation. And so to expand all the shopping centres was, an, was a, you know, probably a clever idea. But what it meant was that in one year, 680 new shops opened in Perth mm. and there were no new shoppers. Mm. So I was uh, caught in a retail slump. Mm. There was a um, uh, boom in leaseholds, but no, no new shoppers. What it meant was the dollar was spread thinner. Buyers had more choice. There were, instead of like being 
30, 40 cafes to choose from in shopping centers. Now there was 80, 100, you know, yeah. and that's all it meant. Anyway, so I had a shop at uh, Galleria Morley, a shop at Midland Gate Shopping Center, and a shop at Whitford City. And I was a single guy running, I had like 80, 90 staff. Mm. You know, you spend days just doing the pays for all of mm. that. So now you'd spread yourself too thin and those businesses lost the heart of the business. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there was a retail slump on top of that. And the retail slump as well. So talk like, about perfect storm. Totally. Totally. I, going into it, saw them as amazing opportunities because I just sold a coffee shop at Riverton Forum Shopping Centre that was a printing machine for money. It was mm -hmm. just amazing. And... Um, so I, you know, I had this experience thinking I could replicate it three times and then yeah. sell on those businesses. And basically, anyway, it didn't happen. I yeah. lost, I lost a million bucks back mm. in the uh, late uh, mid nineties, mm. um, which was quite a bit of money then. Too. Of course, it was again coming back to where we are today. Let's assume it's somewhere between five and ten million bucks at least. And that was not borrowed money. That was my money. Money you had in the bank, gone, vaporized, burnt. How uh, did you feel? How did you feel? And psychologically, how did you bounce back? Okay. How long did it take you to bounce back psychologically? Really interesting. Uh, I had to wriggle my way out of each of the three leases. Yes. Well, um, eventually, you, you know, you did. I didn't go bankrupt. Did had no, um, nobody was pressing for bankruptcy. I was able to pay off all the debts and move out of there um, honorably. And... Um, yeah, so I didn't go bankrupt. But Were I you married at the time? No. Um, oh, okay, I, so you're single at least. Single at least. When I just came out of it, I, I met my now wife. Mm. And um, when I think back, you know, I'm amazed she took me on. Mm. <laughs> she, she saw had, something. You had blood on your knees and your hands at that time. <laughs> she saw something. Anyway, and... Um, well, she's a doctor, isn't she? She's a doctor. She's yeah. a carer, the Hippocratic Oath. She said, she, 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 she I need to take care of this guy. That's right. Well, anyway, it's been a project, let me tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so then I had to do something. I didn't know what the something was. But mm. what I was clear of was that I didn't want to have my own capital in it and I ah. didn't own the stock. Mm. Okay, so the only business that I could see at the time which will kind of do that is is real estate. And also if, you, if one applied themselves, it, it shows up. If, if you had a skill set, you're willing to do the work, then it would, and you don't have to own the stock. So you don't have to inject capital. So like own a premises, buy stock, all of these things, which are traditional business, that the real estate would give you this avenue, this um, vehicle for doing exactly that. Anyway, so um, I started in August, 1998. I did a 10-day Vipassana in silence the week before. So that's a, a Buddhist. What triggered you to do that? Because I mean, uh, yeah, what what was the trigger or the influence? It's not like you're walking down the street one day and decide, I think I'll do a 10-day silent meditation retreat. How, what was the precursor to that? Through all, for the last 30-something uh, years, I've been part of a group of mates called Secret Men's Business. Mm -hmm, right. First Tuesday of the month at, uh, at the various times, each other's boardrooms, uh, our houses, our garages and whatever, and we take in turns. And we have a bit of a roster. All we do is we catch up and we talk. And one of the guys in that is a uh, very famous inventor um, uh, and really, really successful man. And he had just completed a Vipassana out at um, Ellenbrook. Yep. Came back and he was telling us about it. And I thought, that's what I want to do. So I, um, I enrolled to do the Vipassana and uh, 10 days of meditation in silence um fantastic experience i'm yes. actually i i'm i haven't made any inquiries but i would love to do it again mm. um anyway so i i uh, finished the 10 day for passionate and i think that two days later started in real estate and haven't stopped talking since so, <laughs> wow yeah. that's like an elastic band they you've you stored it up and then kaboom you let yourself go that's right um so, yeah, I, I started with a little agency in Claremont called Oliphants. Um, pretty quickly learnt the business because it's a very simple business. and But most people who don't do well in it uh, 
overcomplicate it and uh, don't do the work. Mm. Simple do as that. Work. So um, I would get in there super early in the morning. Back this is going back, you know, late eighties, late nineties. Sorry, and now there's so many more marketing avenues available to people but back then we'd print our own flyers or leaflets on mm. the photocopy machine and distribute them ourselves on our yes. bicycle walk the streets which isn't mm. a bad thing sure so i would get in there at like six in the morning hammer this photocopier i'd bring a fan yeah, the over the photocopy would overheat <laughs> the cover you know they shut down so i'd open all the doors get the fans and cool this the baby down and then get that sucker printing again. And by the time everybody else got into work, which was eight, nine o'clock, I'd already had all my leaflets printed, folded in bags, ready to go out the door. And uh, people would walk in and no one have any idea that I'd been hammering that photocopier for an hour and a half because it would, you know, it would become an issue during the day as people queued up to get stuff done. Yep. Um, so, you know, that's kind of like my character that's yes. off- just, just all- so you will just oh, let's just play with that for a second. If we were to ask you, what is the Simon McGrath character? Um, what, what? I mean, let's go even further. What, 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 what motivates you? If we were to say, what is the internal operating system like a telephone of Simon McGrath? What, what is it? How would you describe that motivation, internal operating system, the software that drives you? There's, there's several things i'll start with a memory that i had we my family went to the first kentucky fried chicken store in west australia down at um near the causeway Mm -hmm. and um a white 911 porsche sc pulled up in the bay next to us Mm -hmm. and my i said i'm going to have one of those Mm. and my father scoffed at me in his simpleness, you know, mm. he was a lawn mowing man at the time, and that was his world. And he, you know, migrated from Wales. The struggle he was in, all the rest of it. He, he said something which wasn't encouraging. In fact, it was just the opposite. But yeah. it turned out, it was all the motivation I needed that mm. I was going to go. I was going to be something. I was going to go somewhere and live a life that was um, not ordinary. What age were you when this triggering moment happened? probably 12 or something. Oh my goodness. That's, that's a young, significant moment. Yeah. And I remember even, even remember the color of the car and the color of the interior. How's that? Wow. And and so um, there was, that is one thing. The thing that motivates me, fear of failure. I'm, I'm shit scared of not, and I'm, and I'm also incredibly frightened of letting other people down. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so the so that compensates that makes me do things. Yeah. To make sure that I don't, mm-hmm. or I make personal sacrifices to make sure that I don't. Mm-hmm. Um, it's I don't know. I, it's, uh, I, I you know, it's, that's a significant driver by the sound of it. But look, and no doubt, this car theme runs thick through your <laughs> motivation and DNA. You've mentioned your father's two Rolls Royces. Yeah. You've mentioned this Porsche, and I know you have a little fetish. Uh, for car collection um so over the years and i know you've you catch up with my old mate brian cummins who also has a car car fetish as yeah. well so that that whole s- smell smell of the leather and the 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 brand and so on interestingly um i met brian cummins because he was a regular customer at ted's cafe yeah i didn't know him before that he was used to come in nearly every day yes guaranteed Twice he's a Virgo and he's a man of routine. And when he has a routine of a lunch place, uh, like it's pretty much you can set your watch at 12 o'clock, he's walking out of the office and going to the the lunch bar that he's got a fetish for. So yeah. that was your place, huh? Yeah. Yeah, that was Ted's Cafe. Um, oh, yeah, just I'm I like classic cars. It's my I'm, I'm that I'm a baby boomer, of course. So you know, cars are significant for baby boomers. I'm uh you know, I, I dig all that stuff, and I like the people. Um, I'm I do a podcast called Classic Cars and Coffee. Oh, nice. So there's where's I'm about to record it tomorrow night. Mm-hmm. Um, so I like the people that are interested in things. Yes, interesting. 
in what what when you say things you don't just mean cars you mean oh it doesn't matter you could be interested in uh, cooking or brewing or whatever but if you if you dig in something then i find you more interesting yes than a person who who's not into something yes so there's a passion there there's a driver which by the way you told me a wonderful story last week because you know we had a Kate Cheney event at your place uh, last year and I knew you were into art anyway. And sure enough, there's my good friend, Michael O'Connell is also a very good friend of yours, a great yep. WA artist. You, 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 you've got a whole lot of fantastic art, but I want you to tell the story. And again, talk about a DNA or internal operating system of what got you to collect that art. Well, there's lo- lots of things. Um, firstly, the physical beauty of, having things that somehow you connect with mm-hmm. surrounding you. That's just, and I could, that I can't find the words for, but I'm all of the paintings we have are like friends. Mm. Or family. They're kind of warm to us. I can't, I'm struggling to find the words for all of that. But there's a rela- there's a heart relationship. There's a vibrational, it's- energetic love relationship with it. Yeah. Thank you. Anyway. So, um, you know, being in business, I've been, a, I was in real estate for 24 years and, there were good times and bad times. Mm. So in the good times, we would, my my bride of 20 plus summers and a few winters, mm. I would um, go to the galleries and the openings of exhibitions and that sort of thing. And uh, we would buy things we liked. And they were kind of um, the indulgence of success as it, as it happened at the time. And then sometimes we would go to galleries and openings, et cetera, and we weren't having a a successful time. So I developed, or it came to me, I don't know where it came from, but it came to me that it would be a very solid affirmation to buy art when you, you hadn't got a lot of money when, you know, when the cash flow wasn't because it was an affirmation about your ability to create Mm -hmm. your, affirmation about your ability to understand the esoteric and one's ability to um or one's acceptance of where we perceived value to be so like it's a it's a piece of paper or canvas with a bit of paint on it yeah mm. it sells for thousands of dollars so it's mm. an agreement. and some things i can look at some paintings and they can be tens and tens of thousands of dollars and I'll go, it's a bargain. It's like, it's absolutely fabulous. How could I not have that in my life? And in fact, if I were to turn the camera that way a bit, I've got a um, Barry Humphreys, Dame Edna, Barry Humphreys, um, bowl that he, he painted and then inscribed to me on the back. And, um, you know, I've looked at that several hundred times and, and that's related a conversation which I had with Barry Humphreys years ago. And he told me how he painted it and where he was. And he'd just come out of divorce and he was in an alcoholic haze living um, in the seaside in Britain somewhere, um, Brighton Pier, I think he said. And, um, you know, I don't know. I just look at that painting and I'm attracted to it. The one behind me up here, this one's uh, by West Australian um, Nigel Hewitt. And it tells the story of the English language spreading around the 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 world uh, through colonization. That's a man of war ship with a British ensign on the back. And yet you'll see um, letters floating around on the ocean. That's the spread of the English language. And then above it, in fact, I'll just move this so you can see it. There's a seagull. Yes. And the seagull is carrying the letter I. And that, what that means now that the language is spreading organically. It's not the British spreading the language anymore. It's just spreading organically. And this painting here is um, my I bought for my wife as a a birthday present at the Derby um, art center, the Aboriginal art center up in Derby. So, but there's not hundreds, but we've got paintings under beds, Lee. The things we. (laughs) Paintings under beds. It's like, I don't know. I honestly can't explain it, but I'm no, I'm not alone. (laughs) Uh, Abundance mentality. Uh, Thank you. Yes. I mean, the fact is when you, whether it be the Barry Humphreys, each of those times you're recalling, you're actually putting out a much a very positive vibration into the universe. You're certainly not focusing on lack. You're focusing yep. on, as you say, 
I can create it. I can create it. You know, you know, as a mate of mine, Pumper Hughes says, it's only money. You just go get more of it. You know, yeah. versus it's money doesn't grow on trees. You know, I literally grew up with money doesn't grow on trees, Lee. I'm not made of money. We don't have the money those people have. Uh, you know, and my darling mother and father, uh, we grew up immersed in lack. And of course, that vibration does not create abundance. Although it's interesting, your fear of failure drives you to cover the bases and do the extra work. So it becomes a great motivator. So there you are, that the fear of failure on the one side, but that constant affirmation of I can create it, I can create it, isn't the world a great place? Um, look, look at all the affirmations over around me that shows me I can create it, which to a certain extent, it's, yeah. Brian's not far behind you in that regard. One, fear of failure. And two, each of these physical things are affirmations that you can just put your brain to it and go create more of it, which is a completely different mindset than than the lack mindset. So that, mate, on the other side, Clearly, you're a great reader. You've got books everywhere there. What are some of the books? Because you say leaders are readers. What are some of the great books or the books you're reading right now that you'd like to share uh, with our listeners that you say are either entertaining or useful or, in or intellectually stimulating? What are you immersing yourself in at the moment? Uh, the book that I'm reading at the moment is on coaching. And oh, yes. um, it's called The Coaching Habit. Coaching Habit. Yep, and I've just, I'm about halfway through this. Say less, ask more, change the way you lead forever. Michael Bungay Stania. Very good. Yeah, so I'm about to embark upon a coaching career. I've registered a company called Defining Moments Trainers, yes. uh, which will primarily focus on the real estate industry. And I've got some dear friends that have been trainers in that space, uh, David James yep. and Ross Hunter, and they're both um, encouraging me to, to move into that space. I haven't mentally been in the space where I wanted to commit, Lee, which mm. I find interesting itself. And I boil it boiled down to a couple of things. I'm I'm far too happy. That's I'm good. far too happy. <laughs> I'm far too happy. But you told me that the word happy is okay. You also mentioned, am I too comfortable? Oh the yes. Da the dangers of being too comfortable. Let's let's talk about that and let's segue back into the coaching. Um what have you done in the past? Because again, we haven't really spent much time right now. That real estate career of yours, clearly you you build up your own business, uh, you took partners in, you yeah. won awards. Just let's talk about that real estate and then we'll go to the coaching because clearly why would someone be coached by you? Let's hear about your career. I, thank you, Lee. I'll relate that back to the fear of failure and the fear of letting people down. Okay, mm -hmm. so during the whole year, it would just be pedal to the metal and mm. sometimes not entirely healthy. And I can't recommend it to everybody, mm. but um, really like I live four streets back from the ocean front in Cottesloe. It's pretty yes. good. And months would go past where I didn't even see the ocean that I lived close to, which is wow. like, really so I developed this thing. I would, instead of coming, driving straight home, I would drive down the coast. So at least I got to see at least it. to look at it. Yeah. At least, you know, anyway. And, and there was a, um, a mental space of always not being where I was, but always mentally being at the next place, mm -hmm. which is a very polluted place to be. Mm -hmm. So you're enjoying where you are because you're thinking about what's that has to be done next. I don't recommend that either. No. Anyway, um, the um, gosh, I forgot the the. the well, you were four streets back. You were so busy, you didn't even see the ocean. The, the, in terms of lifestyle, you were working so hard. Only time we would get. They have the Rewa Awards uh, every year and everyone gets dressed up and all the real estate agents go to the Crown Casino and drink way too much. And the only time, and I've be constantly been in the 1% and 2% in Australia of the top the income earners and producers for that industry, and yet the only time that I would allow myself a, a sort of a minute of gratification is when I stood on the stage getting the award for... Um, the highest grossing in some division or the winner of uh, whatever they, they divide, they put them onto the divisions now. So it's assisted, unassisted teams because um, the awards started to look like a farce pretty quickly because people that run teams were competing with people who just basically weren't ah, running. Yes, yes, of course, yeah. Grouped to try and get these awards. Mm. And they realized this was dishonest, non representative. Well, you weren't comparing apples with apples by that stage. That's right. right. That was literally it. So um, 
but yeah, so when I took the stage and I would turn around and I would grab my trophy and I'd look out and there were like three plus thousand people sitting in the room mm. and I was like in the top five and I'd go, oh, beautiful, beautiful. Oh, interesting. Mm. And that were, so I'd, I'd sort of savor that moment, go back to my table with my trophy and kiss all my staff and hug everybody and and in, and, and celebrate and then I'd go home. I wouldn't stay because I was knackered. Yes. That's the result. So you did, my point is the fear of failure drove me so hard mm. to make sure I covered all the basics and did everything necessary mm. that it also wore me out. And I did get to the point of burnout about uh, two years ago, mm. just after COVID. I had a huge year, which I did single-handedly by that mm. stage of my business, mm. and I didn't have any support staff. The agency supplied provide support staff but it's not like having your own pa yeah and i did this monster year single-handed i think i was i was definitely in the top five in perth of unassisted salespeople. i think i was number two that year and but i just worn myself out lee i just gone too hard for too long and i didn't read the signs and uh i'd i'd listed a house uh, that i probably already had a buy in fact i did already have a buyer for and I was late to the appointment. The people crossed with me, rightly so. Mm. I said, you know what? This is symptomatic. I'm I'm not well. I'm burnt out, I believe. I'm going to give you back your listing. Mm. And the buyer, you you just sell it to him. Just wow. sort it out. It's about $35,000 worth of commission there that I, 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 my biggest fear, I said, look, I'm not only dangerous to myself at the moment, I'm dangerous to you. Mm. Accept that. Mm. I can quite 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 accept and take on the responsibility of being dangerous to myself, mm. but I couldn't, I wasn't willing to drag somebody else into my um my burnt outness, my yes. malaise for whatever it was. And it yes. showed up in several ways. Um just chronic tiredness. I used to get uh, and I also on top of that I had sleep apnea. I didn't know it. Mm. And so I was like, I was a walking wreck. Mm. Mm. Much better, stronger man today. Than I was at the at that particular time. Mm. Um, so now, um, yeah. So I handed back the listing, and he said, "There's the buyer," and they sold it, and that was great. So, Beautiful. So, so there's two things there. Of course, my whole life, right from my master's degree, is uh, the relationship between family, work, and leisure, lifestyle, the psychosocial uh, components to high performance and sustaining high performance. And as you say, you were foot to the metal working flat out and not only that, your wife is a doctor you had two two sons as well so uh, the fact that you're able to go for so long without either a heart attack or some other uh yeah. piece of damage going on is luckily you were either not a smoker or you know yeah. uh, somehow i mean i know you have great love for your wife so that certainly is going to be a, a great um social support structure i mean if you had been a single guy trying to pull that lifestyle uh, uh, personally, I don't think you would have gone that long at that that level. So, right. but so just let's just go back in those heady days. Was there anything you were doing in terms of looking after your mind, body, spirit? Yeah, I've been a, a great advocate for um, self education and alternative education. So, I've I've done most of the alternative sort of things like forum, mm -hmm. uh, money and you. Yep. Um, Doctor D Martini, John D. D Martini, who I yeah. really value. We did uh, Dr. Fred coaching for years. We'd fly across to Sydney or Melbourne a few times a year and spend three days in a room with Dr. Fred, usually over a weekend. Dr. Fred, who who's that? Fred Gross. All okay. right. Yes, heard of that name, yeah. Real estate industry. He's a All right. industry, yeah. very uh, well-respected. He's getting on now. He's probably 90-something. But mm. a doctor who um, turned his hand to ex-rabbi, I believe, turned his hand to uh, training real estate staff or training people in sales generally and going mm. into pretty cool guy. Um, so, you know, a lot of time with him. Um, the, you know, lots of courses, um, Tom Panos, there's a thousand people in the real estate business. Yes. Um, Lee Woodward. I'm about to do the Lee Woodward um, two day um, complete salesman course, essentially as a refresher for me before I go back into that industry. Yep. So I, so I bring my relevance up to speed, you know, in terms of um, 
how time moves, technologies and all sorts of things. Yeah. And I'm to, to know more before I then embark upon it. Um, yeah, there's there's plenty of people in the in the real estate space. And I but what about what about in terms of your own mind and body? So as you say, you never got to the beach. Did you do gym or did you do breathing or did you do meditation? Okay. What did you do? Nothing. No, I did something. I um because I've just find it to work at that rate and not have some kind of self maintenance going on. Um, okay. yeah. Uh, at various times, I've come and gone from yoga. Um, I have, uh, for a while there, we were members of Northcott Surf Life Saving Club, which meant we used the gym and we mm -hmm. regularly do that. Um, I do things like I, I take my little white dog, who I can hear snoring actually in the mm -hmm. background, mm -hmm. um, for a walk every morning. This morning, we walked seven kilometers up um and around swanbourne and cottesloe and so were you doing that when you're working hard uh yeah pretty early in the morning like okay good so you're doing that that certainly is going to be quite helpful to to, to help you clear your mind and get yourself in the uh, a good state physical state yeah um always i probably eat, i do eat too much but always eat really clean great food we grow we've got a big organic vegetable garden so we're always eating just fabulous stuff which is minutes old from the garden mm. my wife's amazing doing that and, and feeding us all um so, and I, I think not smoking and, yes. and being a very um you know a minimal drinker i enjoy mm. a beer or wine but certainly uh you know i never get drunk uh well you know a few times a year i might i might get, drink too much yeah but it's like it's really a very very small part of my. It's not world. weekly and it's not daily. Got it. Nothing like that. Yeah, good. Um, so I think not doing those things. Uh, I've never uh, been attracted to drugs per se. Mm. Um, you know, whether of any description, I just haven't been attracted to drugs. I kind of like get a big buzz out of hanging around. Yeah. This morning, uh, as I walk up uh, Mellon Hill, which is near Allen Park in Swanbourne, there's a, a pathway which rises up. So you, your whole horizon, your vision in front of you is a is a mount side or a hillside, and it's just thick bush with a path decreasing into the horizon. And I every time I get to the base of that that path and I look up at the bush, I'm just in awe. Like mm -hmm. I'm just, I just um, probably 15, 20 seconds, and I often say to Mary, "I'm just stop, just stop, just look at that." And it's the view's never changed, but it's mm. still. Mm. Mm. wow and mm. uh, i'm finding as i get older uh, more appreciation for simplicity looking mm. at the sort of flower mm. Mm. and that sort of thing um being aware of uh, what the wind feels like on my face where the sun's coming from the smell what am i smelling mm. you know all mm. of these and that brings comes back to consciousness um you know i'm really interested in in my early days wayne dyer yeah fantastic coach beautiful man yes and he, um he got me thinking about many things that i wouldn't have been thinking about that i still carry with me today things mm -hmm. like the difference between response and reaction and yes. having knowing that you've got a second voice in your head mm -hmm. and deciding being the boss of that second voice deciding mm -hmm. mm -hmm. if you're not in control of your thoughts who is Correct. you know like that's That's right. Are you your thoughts or are you the observer and controller of your thoughts? Exactly. And the importance of uh, affirmations. So um, one's, you know, our subconscious mind doesn't know the difference between truth and reality. Uh, sorry. And, and uh, fate, you know, uh, yeah. kind of the difference between truth and reality. Uh, sorry. And, and uh, fate, you know, uh, yeah. kind of word for some of this. Yeah. Well, he does the exercise. Imagine cutting the lemon and then putting the lemon in your mouth and your body has exactly the same reaction as if you actually had the lemon in your mouth. Yeah. yeah. What we program ourselves with, you know, that, that growing up in a household where everybody was talking about small business and the orders yeah. that you get out and, you know, that new greenhouse was going to produce X amount of plants and add to the cash flow and the van we needed to buy and the, cement mixer we were going to buy in the potting shed and blah, blah. That was daily life. What that showed up for me, like in business, was I'd have two monitors so I could hold, you know, something on one screen and do something on the other. And above each of those monitors, 
and my staff used to come and laugh at me, but I would have three words printed on a laminated sheet. And those three words were in red on a white background on top of each screen. Because mm -hmm. I believe that um, today the, the big currency is focus. Sure. It's absolutely because we're so so easy to get distracted. There's a thousand platforms that are wanting our attention. Mm. Um, a thousand people wanting our attention. Mm. Mobile phones is just this absolute clamoring to get your attention. And so uh, above the three, the two screens I had, red letters, white background, I'd have three words, and those words were focus, focus, focus on the top of each screen. Mm. And they would remind me to bring me back to center, just drag me back to center. And I would be distracted like any human would. But those three words above each screen reminded me of the danger of not being where I was choosing to be. Yes. Brilliant. Started my attention, taken me away. And, and the analogy that I heard later was that the rocket that went to the moon and landed on the moon was only on target for 1% of the time. Yeah. Only 1% of the time. Course correction, course correction, course correction, course correction. Like this. Yeah, and absolutely. That's, that's right. That's that's what we are. And that, so the, for me, the focus, focus, focus was to get me, you know, try and increase that 1% to 2, 3, 4, 5. And, uh, and it was something as simple as that that worked for me. Something else I used to do is to be aware of my mindset before I went into listing authorities, when I went into to list a property. You were and conscious of mindset. Yeah. So what were you focusing on there? Okay. So I do things like I would play probably ACDC. Interesting. The way there to lift, to lift my adrenaline, maybe um, testosterone. Energy. No, but you know, like that's music that just pumps. And I, and I like, I love so it. So you walked in as a positive vibrating you got beast rather than a half dead, you know, you got it. I didn't carry with me the sad sack. Hmm all my grievances and ailments, those were left way behind because I'd filled my head with a a, 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 strong, a vibe which I welcomed and wanted and worked for me. That was one thing I did. And then on the inside of my sun visor, I would have five affirmations that were there and they would be the last things that I read before I closed the door and went into that meeting. Would you like to share those five affirmations? Remember what they were. It, it's something like, um, you deserve this. You're worthy. Um, they're, they're lucky to have you. Um, uh, ask for the business. Nice. Super important affirmations. All it was, the, the, the trend was to get my head out of the space of imposter syndrome. So, the music mm -hmm. lift mm -hmm. elevated me. Then the the self, the affirmations about being worthy of the business, because I knew I'd never let them down. And mm -hmm. I knew I'd always act honestly. So I knew mm -hmm. that I, the, the the foundations of who I, the product that I brought to the table were worthy. But you can be distracted by so many other things. And the point I'm making here is that um, I'd taken care of this. Side. I knew I could deliver the goods. Yep. The the thing that uh, I needed to know myself that I was worthy mm. and um, to forget the imposter syndrome, mm. push that aside so it didn't become part of it. And then what it does, it gives you a, a, a space to be very playful with people because mm. I'm not worried. I'm just not worried about not getting the business. And and so the commission breath, what they call commission breath. Yes, and, commission breath, yeah. Sure and all of these things that come into being in real estate like you know oh, oh no somebody else is going for the business too well forget about somebody else just be the best version of you be and the best version be authentic of you. and be oh, real boy, and, boy. and that allowed me to to really goof around with a lot of people and have a fabulous time and yeah. get the business done and write monster numbers um right. So they're just a couple of couple of things. But stunning, stunning. Man, I'm making. I've got a page full of notes here. Um, that. But that's beautiful, absolutely yeah. beautiful, mate. Well, we say one: the forest shapes the tree. See, growing up in small business, we've seen this pattern wise over and over again. It's people who are successful in business it doesn't mean you can't be successful in business, but 
you growing up in small business, consciously and subconsciously, as you say, day by day, you're you're learning by osmosis of the do's and don'ts. You know, I mean, if you had a choice of do I hire someone who grew up with in a family of small business or do I hire someone who didn't, I would be erring on the side of persons growing up in small business in terms of understanding of business, sales, customer service. Uh, I mean, there's many examples we we have uh, of that. But uh, that whole thing there of imposter syndrome, we see that we all, I mean, I suffer from that as well. In terms of what are the tricks you use? Actually, I say many, a long time ago, sales, listen to either my material or music or something that lifts you up. Listening to the gardening program, or even worse, you can be listening to parliament, going to a sales appointment, uh, talk about distraction. We say there's the great book called The Inner Game of Golf and in the, in the Game of Tennis as well. Performance equals potential minus interference. And what performance equals potential minus interference. So I've got 100 units of perfor- uh, uh, potential, but 60 units of interference, junk, gardening program, negative, imposter syndrome, I can only ever perform at 40. But I yeah. take the same 100 units of potential, reduce the interference, focus, reduce the interference, get that to 40, I immediately can go to 60, you know, make a big jump in performance. So whether it be sport or sales or business, as you said, calming down, or in your case there, the ACDC to get the energy. Because we say that we say also, you don't manage people, you don't manage yourself, you manage energy. Mm-hmm. How much energy and where's it focused and what's the type of energy? Yeah, I, exactly, Lee. I, I realise that we... All we had was energy. Yes. Telling. There is there isn't anything else. And and, oh, and boy. there's all sorts of energy, but it all boils down to what we're selling is energy. Which is Zig Ziglar. Selling is a trans 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 of, of, of energy of emotion. Yeah. We're 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 machines for reading it. We don't know we're doing it, mm. but all the time we're reading the energy of somebody else absolutely and and of course that's nlp calls it sensory acuity reading the play what am i feeling what am i seeing what what are their eyeballs doing what's the color of their cheek what's their body what's the tone of their voice you're doing it at a conscious and a subconscious level and of course greenberg and mayer a great article in harvard business review we use time and time again of predicting a person's sales success is Ego, ego in the sense of conquer, I want to win, which to a certain extent is fear of failure, and empathy, my ability to read the other person. So we want to be a heat-seeking missile where I'm going to hang in on this deal and keep adjusting my behavior and reading the play, whereas the person with low sensory acuity is often just a bulldozer, not reading the play, and thinking that if I chalk enough and throw enough spaghetti at the wall, some of it's going to stick, which of course doesn't work and the sale certainly doesn't stick and you certainly don't get repeat business and referrals out of it exactly exactly that yeah let's talk about your coaching as you move forward why would you want to coach why don't you just sit around do your radio show and look at your art collection for the rest of your life why would you want to do coaching what's happened lee is that i am coaching people they people have phoned me they want you there simon yeah right you've got all that knowledge no it's like um Recently, um, well, a couple of salespeople have come to me and said, I've got this going on. What should I do? Yeah. I've told, told them what they should do. Or in conversation, um, I've had people um, renew their outgoing message. I said, have you listened to your outgoing message? I said, yeah, it's, like, it's fine. I said, no, it's not. Your energy's mm. Do it. Try it again. Mm. So mm. I record it again. Mm. And it's like, no, it's still not right, is it? And they go, well, yeah, it's not right. Okay, again. And we did it three times. Anyway, they were ecstatic mm. when I'd done this with them. And I, I needed for for just interest, nothing more, yeah. just interest. And their principal, maybe, you know, maybe the principal of an agency should be doing this. And that got me thinking about uh, agency audits. So I can go into an agency and audit everything about it. All the mm. outgoing telephone messages, the reception, what they what I, how navigable is navigatable, navigable mm. is their um, web page, what's the interface like with the public, um, 
be a secret shopper at home opens and then present an agency back a, a complete behind the scenes review of what the public gets because it's but through educated eyes of you know, eyes. through 25 years or more of you know it, it's not just it, it's not just customized it's educated eyes so it's very yeah. constructive report beautiful so i can i can do that also um with all the and i've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on self improvement and courses and that you know i've been to hawaii with robert kiyosaki and um those guys it's like uh i've spent a lot of time and a lot of money in alternative spaces doing things mm. through naivety and inquiry th through um interest you know i've, I've yeah. honestly interested in what makes people tick and why we tick and so i bring bring that to the table is important i've done some nlp workshops i'm this year going to embark, embark upon a hypnotherapy course Fantastic. um so that um, what I want to do is build up uh, about 20 clients that I work with closely. So I want to give them a couple of hours a month, one-on-one, -on -one, which means like arriving wherever they are and saying, okay, come and show me your desk. Let's have a look at your desk. Can you open those files? Can I look in there? Now let's go out to your car. Let's have a look in your car. Can I look in your boot? Mm -hmm. And this will all tell me <laughs> shot of where the head's at. Yeah can uh you know like and then we'll go inside now i want to sit with you while you call 10 people i'm just going to sit next to you that's all i'm wow. going to do and i'll wow. take notes and so in that couple of hours i will give you an audit mm. so to speak. Mm. what it will look like um okay so on the telephone you use the word um reduce price we never say reduce it's always adjust price mm. much mm. more palatable much more easy to sell across you uh, didn't ask these people uh, that were uh, interest in the house if they were selling isn't that a lost opportunity you know and and to go through the whole to pick apart the dialect in a loving you know, supportive encouraging manner mm. and pointing out to people that there's lost opportunities everywhere one of my salesmen reckons that he could live off what fell off my desk <laughs> <laughs> um, the so the underlying thing for all of this is that i genuinely care for people so if i engage with I, I I'm I don't have another operating system it's I if I engage with you I'm interested in you mm. that will show up in, in in the care I give so it looks like um taking on a group of people I want to coach visiting their home opens unannounced phoning them uh, not quite daily but lots they'd mm. have access to me if my phone is answerable like it doesn't go to message bank like I pick it up that means I'm on and um, so you've got access. You might do a, um, a listing presentation at a property and you didn't walk out with the business. So you can find me. And then I'll say, okay, what did you say? What did they say? Okay, did you ask for the business before leaving? Okay, you didn't. You better go back and do that now. Mm -hmm. And if you'd asked for the business, how did you ask for the business? Mm -hmm. What did you say? And so this is where I actually shine the most, or I've been told I shine the most, is in dialogue is in um, guiding people to a place that they actually want to be, but doing it in such a manner that they thought it was their idea. Mm -hmm. Beautiful <laughs> shepherding, shepherding, mate. Yeah, beautiful. It's it's actually closing gates. Yeah. So it's asking questions such. Here's one of my, I've got, there was a, a question that made me millions of dollars at home opens. I mean, millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. I would say to people, uh, oh, where are you living now? Just as casually as that. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm in South Perth. Go, oh, really? South Perth. I love that place. What street? Because really the person who's generally most sensitive about these questions is the person asking them, mm -hmm. the person receiving the question. So if you can get over the sensitivity, like, oh, I can't ask that, you know, um, you can you can make tremendous headway in a small amount of time. Mm -hmm. I go, um, would are you um uh, I'd ask people if they if they had a house. And then I'd say, um, will you be keeping that house? Which is actually reverse of saying, do you need mm. to sell mm, mm, mm. much flattering to ask somebody if they will be keeping this house, even though they're looking at buying another one. Yes. Back in my heart, I 99% of the time I know they've got to sell it. Of course. I'm asking if they're going to keep it. Mm. And people would then go, 
oh no, we've got to sell. Mm. Funny that. Mm. And then I do something which is really cheesy. I'd say, I know a great agent. <laughs> and, like, and I'd go, okay. And I didn't ask if Lee, this is not this is the not either or type question. Yes. I would say, when can I have a look through it? Not no. look through it. Yes. He's begging. When. Assumptive yeah. close on that, yeah. It's like just when is tomorrow good for you? Is it yeah. like and these are um, assumptive questions, but they're still questions, so they're still dignified. Absolutely, mate. Absolutely. No, we call it strategic questioning, and of yeah. course, as you say, it's conscious strategic questioning. You're well aware, and in NLP call it syntax. What is the order in which I ask those questions, uh, and the way I structure them? And of course, the average untrained person or doesn't want to be conscious. Uh, doesn't think any of this is important. But in fact, the athlete or the A-grade performer knows very well that conscious strategic questioning, context, uh, you know, we I call it a system we call POMVIC, which essentially is mainly business to business sales, but it, it works in real estate too. But giving people a scaffold and a structure so that they're consciously asking strategic questions. That's leading, and of course, we talk about buyer f- buying state facilitation you like that very question of are you planning on keeping keeping that house versus do you need to sell immediately you're triggering in the state of no we need to sell you've just triggered that uh, which is just beautiful but that's a whole other area so if people want to get in contact with you uh, have you got a website or anything at this point in time or not no, Lee, I don't. I told you, I'd be happy goofing around with my bike. Yes, okay. So eventually they're going to just need to get you on LinkedIn or something if they want to get yeah. hold of you in the short term. Lee, yeah? this question, um, I, my LinkedIn page is like um, you know, tumbleweed thing that I paid attention to about uh, 20 there's, there's some kind of Clint Eastwood movie soundtrack going through the... <laughs> 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 Got it. How do people get hold of me? Um Probably my Facebook page is a good place to start. Right. Okay, start there. I've got a professional one and I've got a, a goofy one. The goofy one, I don't wear a tie. That's probably the difference. That's really goofy, mate. That's really goofy. But we've been going almost an hour and a half. But what I want to do is ask you, is there any question that I haven't asked you you'd like or topic you'd like to cover before we before we wrap up? Any particular thing you'd like to cover off on? Sure. Thank, thank you, Lee. Um the real question, the real thing that I think makes a, a salesperson a great salesperson, is to add value, mm-hmm. and the and the add value experience is how how are you going to show up in the other person's life such that you offer um, some sort of in a, in a time of anxiety, um, you're able to guide somebody through a tricky situation, a minefield, and I. Mm sold more than a thousand homes. And so that's a lot of guiding people. And so the, the, the ethos of always be adding value is a good way to be. Mm. And, and so even in marriage and in friendships and be the, be the person that asks the question about the other person, be the person that pours the water, be the person that brings something, be the person who is inquiring, be mm. the person who writes the card. Be the person, and it just goes on. So be, be that the person, person. Mm. and in everything else, it's almost will take care of itself. Mm. If you can be that person, also you win because um, the other the, the other day we were at Vans Cafe. There was a power cut through the western suburbs. Vans Cafe couldn't take um, any electronic, mm. so mm. they had the whole cafe full of people eating and dining, and drinking coffees, and no way of them paying. <laughs> I um, I said to the girl, like, well, I'll come back and pay you later in the day. I'll get some cash and I'll come back. And we did, did actually go for a walk, but the ATMs were out as well. So it's like, what use yeah, was that? Yeah. Um, then um, the, the about three weeks later, we were back at Vans for a coffee in the morning. And the point I'm going to make is, um, Mary, my wife, said, did you pay them the money? I said, no, I haven't. She said, you're going to pay them. And I joking, said, no, they don't, give them up. They, sold, they don't need my money. And like this. Anyway, I walked up to the counter and I said to the girl, uh, two coffees for today and two coffees from about three weeks ago when you had no power. And she went, my God. 
Mm. Thank you. Mm. That was not about them needing the money. Mm. Nothing. It was about me affirming that I'm a person of integrity. This actually mattered more to me. Yes. Nine bucks for the coffee was an investment in me, not they didn't need my nine bucks, I'm sure. They'd like it. Yeah. Again, but it was about me cleansing, washing me, making sure that I was whole and wholesome and intact. Yes. I didn't have a little chink in my persona somewhere which says, hey, you're that guy that ripped off vans, you know, inside. Yes. Not even, yes. No one know this. Yes. Entirely an internal dialogue. And the importance of me was to me to pay them. To Absolutely. Make sure I wasn't that other guy. Well, the metaphysics, as you say, it's $9, but it's 900 and 9,000 and 90,000 uh, in terms of weight and vibration and, sure. you know, metaphysical debt, if you know what I mean. I also, and my wife's huge on this. We also pick up litter. Yes. Walk. We pick up litter all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm pretty good at it. I won't pick up tissues mm -hmm. and things like that. But, mm -hmm. you know, bottle, bottles, bottle caps, yes. cigarettes, all of that stuff. We go for a walk. We have, we bring back all this stuff to put in the bin. That the walk is not changed. And the purpose of the walk is not changed. It's just if you walk past that piece of litter, yes, you're condoning littering. Yes. And they say the weed you walk by is the weed that grows. And as you say, what are you reinforcing in terms of uh, accepting lower standards? Uh, and, uh, and and even there's that affirmation, I'm helping make a difference. I'm cleaning up the world. I'm not going to walk past something that's unacceptable. Yeah. Uh, recently, my bride of 20 plus summers and i went to the rushes for a film an environmental film and they were they needed people to to put in money so we went to watch the rushes and um it was a film on native forests and since then the west australian government has declared that they're going to cease logging in old growth and native forests and oh, i was yeah. that movement mm -hmm. contribution so we were sitting in the audience uh they lady who's the director of the film jane hammond would mention that uh, they need to raise another one hundred and seventy thousand dollars seed capital get the film up and running and um i won't tell you the amount that marion and i no sure it in to put in that film but it, it was significant enough to make us uh we were called the producers of yeah. the film today so it's a significant chunk of money but the conversation was between marion and i was that we would die with money in the bank but we might die without black cockatoos in the sky. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't, couldn't let that conscionably, my conscience wouldn't allow me to at least contribute in some sense to try and try to save black cockatoos. Yeah. yeah. We did the same with the, the so this, she's produced now two films, um, Black Cockatoo Crisis, which is winning awards all over the world. Uh, and the previous one was um, Cry for the Forests, which is about logging in the Southwest. And, um, Anyway, and that brought about the change with uh, the McGowan government at the time, and they ceased logging. And I cried, openly wept mm. the day that announcement came over the radio. No one, we didn't know what they were going to tell us that this was going to happen. Mm. So it was a pop, it was just mm. announced. And um, we started to all phone each other, and I said, you know, like, wow, that's amazing. A mm. quick story, Jeff, and it's like you never, and the, the sorry, that. The message I want to give is you may never be aware of the impact of your presence. Okay, so yes. you may not know this, but it does have an impact. Mm. This is what Buckminster Fuller went on about. Now, just as Margaret Thatcher said that her greatest achievement was John Major and New Labour, mm. that's Margaret Thatcher thought of New Labour and mm. John Major. And um one of my greatest achievements was I sponsored the first screening of Cry for the Forests at the Windsor Theatre. There were 400 people there, and I spoke to them beforehand. This is a film about logging in the Southwest. There was a guy in the audience who I'd invited, and his name is Jeff Bremer. And Jeff Bremer is a uh, engineering professor. He's Dutch, and he likes to win arguments. And now he's fighting Alcoa for the mining of uh, bauxite mining in a darling escarpment and uh and because they want to basically they want to mine next to our drinking water supply mm, incredible 
un unbelievable, and chopped down hundreds of years of growth in Jarrah forest. Just bad luck that bauxite grows underneath, uh, sorry, Jarrah trees grow on bauxite. They like it. Mm. Um, so that's one of my greatest achievements was to let loose that crazy Dutchman on Alcoa. <laughs> Well, as you know, so Buckminster Full introduced it and Money and You introduced us to the concept of precession, the precessional force. You move in one direction, but you're creating waves at right angles that often you right. can't predict. And so you doing that uh, screening uh, precessionally has set the, your, this fellow off. And as we say, um, often the, the, the benefit is to the shareholders in, in New York somewhere uh, at the expense of the ecosystem over here. And as I talked to you the other day, my good friend Greg Campbell with his book, Total Reset, bringing us to realise, you know, the Aboriginal, the First Nations people have looked after this place for 65,000 years with a light footprint or, in fact, no footprint. And here we are 200 years in. And if we draw the line straight with people like Alcoa and others, um, we won't be around for another 100, let alone, you know, 65,000. Yeah. Um, it's not a sustainable, but the the word sustainability to them is, well, let's just destroy the forest, dig a big hole and then fill it up with whatever, maybe uh, later on. I mean, I'm sure they'll argue to the contrary, but mate, there's so many great things we've spoken about here. As you say, adding value, heart driven business, being the best version of you, the Twin Peaks salad, that point of difference, that standout, be the person who, um, the two Rolls Royces. You're doing such a marvellous job in that negotiation, the power of silence and negotiation. Uh, it goes on, and I've got it all here. I'm going to do another podcast just on the points I've made here. The power of, and the education of small business. Just that one deal alone of you get one-third share of anything you create from this point onwards is such a beautiful, simple, powerful formula in terms of, as the Chinese have a proverb, do not forget to give the wing to the person who gives you the whole chicken. And, I mean, you, you know, it's a beautiful piece. Um, we can always learn from others. And, in fact, here we go. Uh, who was it that said, the reason I have Isaac Newton, the reason I have seen so far is because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. And here you are with your uh, coaching, mentoring about to start, assuming you get beyond comfort. Um, yeah. You know, people can stand on your shoulders in the real estate industry. They can stand on your shoulders, I would say, in the coffee hospitality game too. But for the purposes of narrow niche, which is a big enough niche anyway, real estate, standing on your shoulders and what you're offering there, your care and your attention to detail, the audit, sitting, I mean, all of those things in real time are just beautiful coaching. I would call it coaching mentoring because it's it's a combination of the two of those things that, that, you, that you're doing there, Simon. And here today, talk about be the person who you have been and are the person who literally, big heart, big heart. We talked about the importance of heart-driven businesses. Uh, you'll do heart-driven coaching and heart-driven mentoring in, you, in your industry. Mate, is there anything you'd like to say before we before we wrap up? Um, simply that it's a privilege to be alive. Absolutely. The alternative. Like, you know, um, I'm still in wonderment at the beauty which surrounds me. Yeah. And uh, to just appreciate even the coolness of a breath, mm. breathing in through our noses and having mm. this. Yeah, very lucky people. I mean, yeah. how, how lucky are we just to be born and living in Western Australia? That well, like, as you, four streets back from that fantastic Cottesloe Beach, but I was swimming down there this morning with all my good friends and then having coffee afterwards and talking funny yeah. stuff. You know, uh, we've got uh, Carlene, the Canadian, who's just come back from beekeeping down south and talking with about the wonders of, of bees and the importance of bees and honey. Uh, uh, just those conversations, you, actually, you treasure them every morning. I, know we're, I think because we've just swum two kilometres, our serotonin and dopamine is high. We're, we're having a high on life in the morning, uh, let alone that connection. And, of course, the beautiful thing is, all around Australia, all around the world, but particularly around Australia, there are communities of people gathering every morning around beaches, surf club gyms, uh, swimming, coffee shops, and the gaggle and the positivity in the change rooms uh, and at the coffee shop. That's the joy. The French, what do they call it? Voie de vie. 
mate, you bring it. You bring it, but you consciously bring it, uh, whether it be in real estate or on radio. People, please do 107.9 Wednesday morning with Simon. Please go and listen. Um, our interview last week, mate, people, are, you know, between Lee crying and, you know, you we're being polished. My mate, I spoke to on the phone this morning, is a mad national party mate uh, in Queensland. I said, I'm, I'll send you the interview. I know you're going to disagree with me on a whole range of points, but in amongst it all, I literally have said, to my kids and my grandkids, when I'm long and gone and they go, who was Grandpa Lee? I said, listen to that interview. It's all yeah. there. Lee, there was so many. I have a format of questions that I ask, and one of them is, um, who are you? Mm. Well, I never, you, you know, I got about five minutes into this and the whole question is just, just you know, <laughs> or, go somewhere. You know, yeah, they, yeah. Well, you said bring 10 songs and we only got through six. That's right. Yeah, 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 it's fantastic. And today, look, we've gone well over an hour and a half now. We'll probably have to do another one. I tell you what, it'd be good to do one when you've done six or 12 months of the coaching. And, and um, oh. you know, and I think what will happen, I was thinking I'm going to re-register, re well, not re-register, because my company performance development consultants have just been sitting there. My accountant said to me years ago, oh, Lee, you should call it Lee Farnell Best Business. But over time, I think, I, I, people like I, what I'd like to do, Simon, is as we move forward, anyone in real estate who wants, wants anything, I think I'd prefer to just refer you and then we can talk turkey about a clip or no clip and what we're doing in our lifter, our local business uh, networking group, which, by the way, you and your secret men's business mastermind, it's just another great example of the power of meeting regularly with a group of people and the intellectual and strategic exchange that goes on, which, of course, Napoleon Hill, no two brains can come together, no two minds can come together in a spirit of harmony and cooperation without creating a third mind. That's in the book Think and Grow Rich. You know, when he did, he studied 500 of the world's most successful people and said consistently the world's most successful people meet regularly in masterminds, coming together in a spirit of harmony and cooperation to create a third mind. In other words, yeah. collectively, we're smarter than any one of us can be. And there you are, some of the triggers, including the 10-day silent retreat. Um, so we do this with Lifter, and I've said to people, we want to trade and help each other trade, and you want to get a clip or take the clip and give it to a charity, which it might, in my case, be Youth Futures or Meetings for Mind or the Neuromuscular Foundation of WA, which, of course, what we're doing is our Swim for Empowerment again. I'm swimming to Rotto again twice um, this summer, one on my own and once with my son. So, mate, by the way, you are welcome to come and swim with us anytime. Just reach Walk over the hill. There's the beach. And we're there at, ready to hit the water at 6.15. It's tomorrow morning. Okay. All right. You've got the flippers. You're right. Mate, right. thank you so much for your time, Simon. You Absolutely me. beautiful stuff. And uh, listeners, talk about leading your best life, particularly in and around real estate or small business. You've just had a gold mine. Simon, thank you so much, mate. I'll see you again very soon. Lovely. Thank you so much, Lee. All the best, yeah. mate. Bye. Bye.